two kinds of stress in life. The stress of things on their own, given that they're compounded, and it takes a certain amount of effort for them to stay together, and it's an unstable compound. That's one kind of stress. The other kind of stress is the stress that comes from craving, and that's the real problem. The fact that a tree or your experience of a tree is a stressful experience simply because there's compounded elements there. That's not a real problem. The real problem is if you cling to the tree, if you hold on to it, if you try to find happiness based on the tree, then you've got a problem. The first kind of stress is the stress of the three characteristics. The second kind is a stress in the Four Noble Truths, dukkha, which can also be translated as suffering, dis-ease. That the Buddha said we have to comprehend, and he gave us tools for comprehending it, five aggregates. If there's any stress in the mind, weighing the mind down. You can know for sure that it's because you're clinging to any one of the five aggregates or any combination of them. And even though we take our stress and our suffering very personally, these are tools for learning to step back from the suffering. So you can watch it and see it simply as an event. You can. Learn to put it at arm's length, so you can build up an identity around it. This is one of the reasons I like to translate the word dukkha as stress. If you translate it as suffering, sometimes you build up all kinds of melodramatic narratives around the suffering. But if you say simply, okay, there's stress in life, and it doesn't have to be there, it makes it less romantic. So you can look at it simply as an, a totally unnecessary addition to what's going on. And as long as you're experiencing time and space as you're living this life, they're going to be, there's going to be the necessity to deal with the aggregates. You treat your body, you look after your, what's going on in the mind. They're going to be feelings and perceptions and thought constructs and consciousness. That's all part of this life. It's the clinging that's optional. It's the clinging that's unnecessary. That's what you've got to learn to comprehend. But first to comprehend it, you have to understand what are the five objects you cling to, because that helps it take apart the sense of the me here or the my suffering. And you look at it in personal terms. There's form. The form can be the form of your body. Or it can be any sensory input at all. And as for the form of the body, that's made of what's what are called the four elements or the four properties. There's solidity and there's liquidity. Energy and warmth. Those kinds of sensations count as form. You're sitting here. The reason you know there's a body here is because of these four kinds of sensations. Now, on top of that, there may be feelings of pleasure or pain, or neutral feelings. And even though these may be associated with a body, there, they themselves are not body. And it's important to make that distinction because we often confuse them. Say there's a pain in your leg or a pain in your back pain in your shoulder. The pain and the shoulder often get equated in your mind, like the pain has seized the shoulder, fully inhabiting the shoulder. You can't have any experience of shoulder without the pain. Or the same with the knee, whatever, wherever the bo body and the pain are dwelling together. We tend to glom them together as one thing. 
and so say the pain and the sensation of sens solidity become one, or the pain and the sensation of warmth become one. Now that solidity lasts for quite a while. The same with the other elements. And so it makes it seem like the pain is just one constant buzz right there. Because you've glued it together with something that is more solid and lasting. But if you can learn how to distinguish between these two things, okay, there's the pleasure and there's the pain, and then there's the solidity and warmth and liquidity and energy. Put them on two different sides. See them as two different kinds of sensation. Then say if there's a pain in your leg, focus on the the form sensations. And a lot of the pain and pleasure sensations just to come and go. And you begin to see that they really are very fleeting. They come and go, come and go, come and go. And just that insight is often enough to help you see that the suffering that you so strongly identified with is not nearly as solid as you thought it was, because you glued it on to something solid. And now you can unglue it. This is why discernment is often compared to a knife, and just cutting through different things, seeing how you can analyze your, your sensation of the body in different ways. And then we're, you're watching the pains coming and going, you're going to begin to see that they're affected by your perceptions. These are the labels you put on things. One of the major labels, of course, is your label of the pain. And there may be also a visual image in the mind that you create around the pain. To learn to see that as something separate, because the perception arises and passes away. The perception arises and passes away, and it will have an influence on the amount of suffering you have around the pain. Sometimes it actually influences the actual physical pain as well. You want to look for that connection, and the only way you can see that connection is realize that, that they are separate things that arise and pass away together. That's one of the things you want to look for when there's a physical pain, and yet there's also mental pain that goes along with it. The mental pain is totally unnecessary. The physical pain is part of having a body. These things are bound to be there. But the mental pain is unnecessary. You don't have to carry the physical pain around. The reason you do carry it around is there's a perception, the perception of my pain, or my knee is pained. So again, you can use the, the template of the aggregates to start dividing these things up. There's the body, and there's the feeling, and then there's the perception, the label you have about the pain. And then there are all those thought constructs. These are the narratives you build up around the pain. Why is this happening to me? I don't deserve this. Or you think about all the pain you've suffered for the past hour or so, or for the, that, especially if you've been ill. It's been there for a long time, and it may be there for a long time into the future, and you start thinking about that. That adds more suffering on top. So again, see that the perception and the thought constructs are optional. And you don't have to believe them, you don't have to feed off them. This is where our emotions around pain, both physical and mental, get, get formed. It's in this thought construct area. And we put all these things together into stories. Why is this happening to me? and on and on and on. So take that apart as something separate. And then there's your consciousness of these things, just the simple awareness. The pain is one thing, the awareness of the pain is something else. Again, they don't have to bleed together where they often do, or don't have to be clombed or glued together the way they often are. Just try to see the pain simply as something as, as the Buddha says, yata puta yana dasana, simply as something that has come to be without looking at what you might make out of it, or how you might connect it with something else and equate it with something else, just as something that's there. 
on its own, separate from the form, separate from the perception, separate from the thought construct. When you can be aware of these things as separate things, you be, it begins to cut the suffering down to size, chop it up into little bits. And you, at the same time, can pull out of it whatever your clinging was to these things, your identification with them, that these are me or these are mine. Or you're feeling that you are being oppressed by the pain and you want to find some, some sensations of pleasure, and so you struggle with those. You can stop that. You just look at, okay, this is something that simply has come into being. You want to watch it as it is coming into being, without seeing what you can whip it up into. It's like having raw materials for a meal. But you realize that every time you put the meal together, the food tastes horrible. So can you just leave the raw materials alone and not try to feed off them, not try to make a meal out of them? Of course, the mind will complain. So what are you going to feed on? Well, this is why we have concentration. This is why we have our topics of meditation, to give the mind something else to feed on so it doesn't have to feed off its perceptions and thought constructs that lead to suffering. So try to get the mind in a good, solid place, as the Buddha said. It's, it's when the mind is in concentration that can see things as they've come into being, i.e., before you've manipulated them and dressed them up into something else. Just see the raw materials as they are. The mind in concentration can see them. The mind out of concentration can't see them in that way. So once the mind gets settled down and you encounter a pain someplace in the body or a feeling of dis-ease in the mind, learn how to take it apart in terms of these qualities or these, these raw materials. This way, when you cut suffering down to size, you can find it. You find it's a lot more manageable, and you don't have to suffer. You don't have to make those wretched meals that you've been making for so long. Because on the one end, you've got better food, and this better food ultimately will take you to the point where you don't need to feed. The raw materials can be left as raw materials. If you put them together, you've learned how to put them together in a much more skillful way. And if you don't need to feed, well, you can give them to other people who do need to feed to help them along their way. So these are a few beginning directions in how to comprehend suffering, the suffering that comes from our craving and clinging and ignorance, because that's the only suffering that's really a problem. And you find as you start along this direction that you'll gain your own insights into how precisely you've been feeding, how precisely you've been trying to put these things together into whatever the kind of meal it was. But this is enough to give you a start.